<clears throat> All right. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm going to talk about a software transactional memory implementation or library for OCaml that I've had the pleasure to work on with the support of my colleagues. In this talk, I'm going to briefly highlight some features of the library, uh, illustrate some of its internal data structures and algorithms, discuss how the library interoperates with other concurrent programming libraries, and more. If you open a textbook on concurrent programming, it will likely tell you that you need three ingredients for concurrent programming. Transactional memory doesn't give you independent threads of control, but it does give you a nice mechanism for such threads to communicate and synchronize with. Transactional memory is basically an abstraction for shared memory concurrency, where threads communicate via shared memory data structures. It is inspired by the database world, where you have transactional databases allowing you to manipulate state using queries with ACID properties. Perhaps the main advantage of transactional memory is that it is, in some sense, familiar, as it allows you to keep on using familiar-looking sequential code and data structures. Our software transactional memory library is called KCAS. And as you can see from this graph, development of KCAS already started many years ago. It was originally designed as a kind of low-level library, providing a multi-word compare and set primitive for the purpose of implementing a higher-level concurrent programming library called Regents. The recent work on KCAS has extended the scope of the library significantly, turning it into a proper software transactional memory implementation, while also significantly improving the performance of the library. Furthermore, KCAS now also comes with a library of data structures. Before continuing with the introduction, I want to mention that there's a two-part blog post that discusses the recent work on KCAS comprehensively. You might want to read that blog post to learn more about the library. KCAS provides an abstraction of shared memory locations of the location module, which is essentially a superset of the OCaml standard library atomic module, which in turn provides an abstraction similar to the mutable references of ML. KCAS also provides direct style transactions over shared memory locations. The transfer function on this slide is a transaction that can be used to move an amount from one account to another atomically. The labeled XD parameter refers to the transaction log, which is explicitly passed by the transaction function to all the operations that manipulate shared locations. To perform the transaction, one calls the commit function, which requires the transaction function to be polymorphic with respect to the transaction log, because the transaction function may be called multiple times and the log must not be leaked. Let's look at a bit more realistic example of a least recently used cache, which is essentially a kind of bounded hash table. A simple way to implement such a cache is to use a hash table and a doubly linked list. The doubly linked list is used to track the order of accesses and decide which bindings to drop in case the cache becomes full. What's important here is that both the hash table and the doubly linked list are manipulated by the operations which is so common in sequential programming that one doesn't even think about it. The problem is that this is not concurrency safe, even though the individ individual operations on hash tables and double linked lists happen to be concurrency safe because they come from the data structure library of KCAS. So how do we make this safe? Well, obviously the first step is to add a few extra spaces, and then we fill the blanks to turn the functions into transactions by passing the transaction log to transactional versions of the operations on the hash table and doubling it list. As good as this may appear, this is not too far from the truth that transactions basically allow you to continue using familiar sequential looking ways to structure concurrent code. Before we move to the next slide, note that the get op transaction is non-blocking and returns an option. And the set blocking transaction is, like the name says, blocking, such that it will not return in case the capacity of the cache is zero. What we see here is that we can convert between blocking and non-blocking transactions. First, we convert the non-blocking get. In case we couldn't return some value, we simply raise the retry later exception, which signals to the commit mechanism that the transaction should be retried only after some locations accessed by the transaction have changed. Dually, we convert the blocking set to a non-blocking transaction by handling the retry later exception. <coughs> 
this, by the way, also shows that uh, you can basically use all uh, ordinary uh, control structures of OCaml, including exceptions. Finally, we build upon the blocking version of get to create a conditional get that blocks until the value passes a given predicate. We do this explicitly, scoping the changes by taking a snapshot of the transaction log and rolling it back before we signal retry. So this ensures that in case we roll back, then, then the changes done by get do not get recorded in the log. Putting it all together, here's a simple example that creates a couple of caches and spawns a domain that blocks to conditionally get an element from one of the caches. Once a cache has been populated with a passing value, the domain completes. Next, we are going to look at how transactions work under the hood. But first, we take a look at how locations are represented. As usual, the trick is a level of indirection. This diagram shows a location named X whose value is undetermined. The state of location supports this possibility by storing two values, the values 0 and 2 in this case, and by pointing to a transaction marked as undetermined. What we see here is the same location x, but this time the value of the location has been determined to be the after value. Note that the state still includes the before value. If the values were pointers, this could be a possible space leak. In this diagram, we see that both the before and after values are the same, and the transaction state has also been inlined to the location state. While this representation is slightly redundant, there is no leak. It could also happen that the value of the location is determined to be the before value. And then the extra space could also be released similarly. So here is a simple transaction that reads the location D and then adds the value of D to the location X and subtracts it from the location Y. Let's look at how this transaction runs in more detail. As an overview, overview here is a list of phases that the transaction goes through. We will now go through the phases. This is the initial state at the beginning of our transaction. We have the shared memory locations D, Y, and X at the bottom in the order of their IDs. At the top, we have the transaction log, which is marked as undetermined and is currently empty. An empty display tree to be more precise. Then we start to build the transaction log. The first operation we need to record is the read of the D location. We see words of the location D being read, being read marked in blue. Then we create an entry, a split tree node, in the transaction log, corresponding to the read in the form of a compare operation. The red words are being written to. Then we read the location X for the fetch and add, oper fetch and add operation. And add an entry to the transaction log corresponding to the fetch and add. Notice that we now created a compare and set node. We can tell th that this is the case because we allocated a new state record with the values 1 and 3 and with the pointer back to the root of the transaction log. The previous compare operation, on the other hand, on the D location, simply points to the state of the D location, which, crucially, does not point to our transaction log. Then we do the read of the Y location. And add the compare and set operation to the transaction log, like we did with the X location. The transaction log is now complete, and we move to the execution phase. In the execution phase, we go through the log in the order of the IDs of the locations, which we can do by traversing the display tree in order. The first operation is the compare of D. To execute the compare operation, we will just verify that the location D still points to the same state that we captured in the log. Note that we compare the state by reference, which conveniently avoids ABA problems. To execute the compare and set operation on Y, we first check that the location Y still has the same value as before. And it does, so we will execute the compare and set to change Y point to point to the new state in the log. And here we see the Y location updated. Uh, note that we did not update the old state of Y, we simply updated the location to point to the new state. Also, the value of location Y is now undetermined, and it points to our transaction log. This means that any concurrent access of Y will use the transaction log to execute the transaction to determine the value of Y, uh, just like we are doing. The last operation to execute is the compare and set of X. First we compare, and then we perform the compare and set, op set operation and update the X location. 
we have now executed all the operations recorded in the transaction log. The next phase is to verify the compare operations. So we go through the log again, identify the compare operations, which do not point back to our transaction log, and verify that the compared locations still have their original states. Once the verify phase is complete, we can perform the final compare and set and determine the values of all the currently undetermined locations. At this point, the values of the locations we modified are marked as determined, but they now contain values that are no longer needed. So, as the last step, we go through the transaction log once more, overwrite the unused values, and inline the transaction state to the locations we modified. What we saw here was the successful or the happy path case. In case of failure, however, we simply marked the transaction as determined unsuccessfully, and all the locations that we managed to modify, whether we managed to modify any, some, or all of them, will then have the values they had before. And then we will also need to perform a release step symmetrically to the, unsuc uh, to the successful case. The previous diagrams and discussion omitted some minor details. Uh, in particular, we didn't discuss blocking and the handling of evaders. We also ignored details related to the retry mechanism. But let's move on to the next topic. As KCAS employs non-blocking algorithms, it requires very little from the scheduler and can also work in contexts such as signal handlers where locks would be inappropriate. However, some features of KCAS, uh, namely blocking and timeouts, require help from the scheduler. The problem is that one cannot simply suspend and resume a fiber or request that an action would be performed after a given period of time because the way such concurrent runtime services need to be performed depends on the context. Perhaps in the future there are standard effects for some of these, but today we don't, and we need a solution that works not only with specific effects-based cellulars, but also with plain domains and systhreads that do not have any handlers. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, perhaps a level of indirection. So what if we store such mechanisms in domain or thread local variables with essentially the same kind of dynamic binding structure as effect handlers? This allows default mechanisms not based on effects and also allows schedulers to install their own implementations of the mechanisms without having to agree on exact effect type constructors and libraries like KCAS can then simply dynamically invoke the mechanisms installed for the current dynamic context. So this is what I ended up with. Uh, the domain local await service allows you to suspend and resume the current thread of execution and the domain local timeout service allows to request an action to be performed after specified time in seconds. The using functions are for schedulers to install their own implementations, much like one would install an effect handler. To use the services, one simply calls uh, the prepare for a wait or the set timeout a function. Here's an example of a scheduler friendly sleep function. It first uses the domain local await service to obtain a pair of actions. One action to release and another to await. The domain local timeout service is then used to request the release action to be called after the, after the desired number of seconds. Then the await action is called, which suspends the current thread of execution until either the release action is called or the current thread of execution is cancelled, in which case await raises an exception and we cancel the timeout to avoid leaks. Uh, you might wonder why should one bother with something like this. Uh, well, currently the OCaml standard library sleep app function in the Unix module is essentially unusable with effects-based schedulers because it blocks the entire domain or thread such that no other fiber can be scheduled to run on the domain or thread. This has already caused surprises to people interested in trying out multi-core OCaml. More generally, I'd like to propose that concurrent schedulers and libraries in multi-core OCaml would agree on a set of concurrent runtime services for interoperability. This would allow many libraries requiring those services to be written in a scheduler agnostic manner. This would even make it possible to implement transparently asynchronous I.O. in a scheduler agnostic manner. In fact, I have implemented a proof of concept of this and several other currently lacking features of multi-core OCaml as examples in the domain local await library documentation. Now imagine a world where we didn't have this uh, kind of interoperability. Libraries like KCAS would need to be parameterized in some cumbersome manner or would need to be specialized to each and every scheduler. I wish I had more time to elaborate on this, but I'd really love to see OCaml having an ecosystem of interoperable 
rather than community dividing concurrent libraries. Currently, EIO, Domain Slip, and Moonpool support domain local await, and KCAS should work on all of those. In the near future, I expect Saturn, uh, our lock free data structure library, to also start using domain local await. Let's then move on to discuss a trade off that KCAS makes. The algorithms underlying KCAS have many nice properties. In particular, updates to memory are disjoint access parallel, and there is no global sequential bottleneck during updates. Most importantly, a transaction may only commit successfully in case it has observed a, a consistent snapshot of memory. However, it is possible for a transaction to see an in inconsistent view of shared memory locations with values committed by multiple different transactions. Having seen such an inconsistent view, a transaction cannot commit successfully and must be retried. Unfortunately, that can still cause problems. Uh, here's an example of a problematic transaction. The idea is that the two, two locations, XS and I, are always updated together, and that accessing the XS array with the index I is always safe. Unfortunately, it's possible for a particular attempt of the transaction function to get the values of XS and I from two different transactions. This means that the array XS could be out of bounds. This property of KCAS isn't unique. Uh, while there are algorithms for software transactional memory that do not allow transactions to observe such, such inconsistencies, several software transactional memory implementations have chosen to use algorithms that do not do allow it. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that the known algorithms to rule out such inconsistencies tend to be relatively expensive. To mitigate the problem, KCAS implements an efficient periodic validation scheme. This means that transactions that only record updates of shared memory locations and do not perform partial operations relying on invariance between shared memory locations are safe. And that basically applies to everything we have seen except for the one problematic example. Unfortunately, periodic validation is only effective against problems caused by partial... Uh, unfortunately, periodic validation is not effective against problems caused by partial operations relying on invariance between multiple locations. For those cases, KCAS provides an explicit validation mechanism that allows one to validate that locations recorded in the transaction log have not been updated outside of the transaction, which ensures that any invariance between such locations will hold. Before concluding, let's briefly discuss another elephant in the room, performance. While I have spent a great deal of effort optimizing KCAS, it is clear that transactions have some unavoidable overheads in the form of additional indirections, allocations, and memory accesses compared to the use of plane atomics, for example. How does KCAS actually perform? Here are results from a set of two benchmarks that have a single shared queue accessed by multiple domains running in parallel. The standard li library version naively uses a mutex to protect a sequential queue. The Saturn version uses lock-free Michael Scott queue implementation. As can be seen, the KCAS queue does not perform all that badly. In this benchmark, KCAS even beats the lock-free Michael Scott queue of the Saturn library in a couple of configurations. I should note, however, that I have also written a much faster implementation of the lock-free Michael Scott queue in OCaml. With that said, the performance of the KCAS queue should be unlikely to be the bottleneck in most practical situations. Here is a similar benchmark using a triber stack. With such a simple data structure, the higher overhead of KCAS does show, but I still argue that the performance of KCAS should be fine for most use cases. As the last benchmark, here are our results from a hash table benchmark. Like with the earlier Q benchmark, the standard library version naively uses a mutex to protect the hash table. What can be seen here is that while KCAS ha the KCache hash table has higher overhead for writes, it can outperform naive blocking already at just two parallel domains. Reads with the KCache hash table can proceed in parallel without interference and scale well. Always take benchmarks with a cup of salt. There is still a lot of work to do to benchmark KCAS and other approaches. While it's clear that KCAS has some overheads, it also seems to be able to perform reasonably well. Furthermore, KCAS and the associated data structure library have been engineered to avoid common performance pitch pitfalls such as false sharing. While the implementation of high performance data structures takes effort and insight, even with KCAS, it is typically much easier than the implementation of similar data structures using atomics. 
And with KCAS, you get the composability, blocking, and timeouts. So in summary, KCAS is a software transactional memory implementation for OCaml. It is based on a new and efficient KCAS and an NCompares algorithm wrapped behind a convenient direct style interface. It comes with a library com of composable, reasonably well-performing concurrent data structures, and it supports secular-friendly blocking and timeouts. Thank you. Questions? Uh, quick, okay. Um, do you intend to support hardware, hardware support uh, for hardware uh, memory transaction? Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, I have not considered it uh, in detail, but uh, it's something that uh, has been suggested. So perhaps if there is time to do future work on this, then maybe. But currently, I would say that there are also some techniques used in uh, used with KCAS that uh, are sort of incompatible with at least some of the uh, hardware transactional memory implementations that I'm aware of, because uh, it's also possible to use uh, algorithms where you do operations outside of the transaction, and uh, if everything is transactional, then that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so 